Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Fanjin, and my colleague sitting in the front row over there is Jian. And both Jian and I are software engineers from a San Francisco data startup called MetaMarkets. Uh, today, we wanted to talk to you guys about this idea of building a real-time analytics data stack using existing open source technologies. And specifically, we're going to be talking a little bit about Kafka, Hadoop, Storm, and Druid. This talk is really based off of our experiences from building out a real-time analytics data stack um, at MetaMarkets, and we use it primarily for online advertising data. Um, but we're going to talk about the general problem of working with event data, and then we're going to talk about how we gradually introduce different technologies to solve some of the problems um, involved with working with this type of data. Uh, we're going to go into the architecture of the stack that we ended up with, what that looks like and ultimately how you can go about with getting the stack and trying it out for yourself at home. So to start off with the problem, uh, what we're all trying to build is we're trying to build applications and these applications allow us to arbitrarily and interactively explore time series data. Uh, now for us, we work primarily with online advertising data um, but some of the different applications that we've seen, uh, some of the different data stacks that we've seen uh, built that are very similar to ours, um, those stacks use system and application metrics data. Uh, they use network traffic monitoring data or like website and activity stream monitoring data. So time series data is pretty prevalent. Now with the applications that we're trying to build, uh, there's several general problems that we need to solve. Uh, for us in particular, we care a lot about multi-tenancy. So potentially many, many users using the system at the same time, issuing a bunch of concurrent queries. Uh, we obviously care about the scale of our application and the scale of our data platform. Uh, we got to make sure that it can meet growing volumes of data. Um, in production right now, we're actually dealing with over 10 terabytes of data daily. And we issue numerous ad hoc queries that, that uh, try to get results from trillions of events. Um, finally, we care quite a bit about recency, uh, this whole idea of real time, and being able to explore events as they're occurring, not hours after they've occurred. Um, so to provide context with some of the applications you can build with the stack that we're going to describe, and to get a little bit of understanding of how users can interact with a data-heavy application, I actually have a very simple demo, and I hope that the internet works. Um, we were trying the wireless before, and it was really questionable. So this is a dashboard, and what this dashboard is visualizing is edits as they're occurring on Wikipedia. So anytime anyone makes an edit on Wikipedia, it basically generates an event, and this event contains a timestamp of when the edit occurred. It contains different attributes about the person or the individual doing the edit, and also, demo, and also some information about the page being edited. Um, there's also some metrics involved in any edit, such as number of characters added to a page or the number of characters deleted. Um, so on this dashboard, you can see the number of edits that have occurred over the last week. There's about 1.8 million of them. Uh, you can see the number of unique users that were doing edits and the total number of characters added or deleted here. And um, if we want to do a little bit deeper exploration, we can do a filter on country United States. And we can see, you know, these are the top edited page in the United States over the last week. So Farewell, My Love, which is apparently a band, is getting a lot of edits in the US. Um, we can do things like we can filter on a particular city, such as St. Lewis. Okay, and we can further explore this Wikipedia data and we can see the voice uh, apparently is pretty popular in St. Louis, as is uh, Fast and Furious characters. Uh, that was a pretty cool movie, so I'm on board. Um, you can do things like you can compare 
uh, the top edited pages, and you can zoom into different time ranges. Like over the last few hours, you know, what are the what are the top pages that are being edited, um, and so on and so forth. Okay. Cool. So I'm really glad that the internet held up because we made these slides like five minutes before this presentation, thinking that the internet might not work. Okay. So. Uh, in order to build an application like the one I just demoed, and really any time where you're trying to build a data stack or you're trying to build a solution that involves analytics on top of a lot of data, uh, the first solution, the first technology you might think about using is Hadoop. And you know Hadoop is a very powerful tool. Uh, you can load all of your data into Hadoop, and you can query it, and maybe you've solved all the problems you wanted to solve with that data. Is it really that simple? Well, it's true that uh, you can do everything with Hadoop. You can do data ingestion. You can do data processing. You can do queries on top of Hadoop. Um, and while MapReduce is a very great general framework, um, it can handle almost every distributed computing problem that you can think of. Uh, MapReduce is not particularly optimized to do a lot of things very well. In particular, uh, MapReduce queries, uh, MapReduce of your raw data can be very, very slow. And when you want interactive exploration of data, uh, what a lot of companies have realized, and what we realized a few years ago as well, was that you oftentimes need to put a query layer in front of Hadoop. And um, that query layer can really help optimize the queries you're trying to make. So our solution gets a little bit more advanced in that we introduce a dedicated query layer to make queries faster, and we use Hadoop for pre-processing and storage. Now, there are a lot of different choices in a query layer, um, and we generally recommend that when you're choosing a query layer, you try and pick a solution that's optimized for the types of queries you're trying to make. So for us, uh, we are particularly concerned with business intelligence style queries. And these queries might be things like, uh, we want to know how much revenue was generated over time, broken down by some demographic. Or in the advertising world, this could be the top publishers based on clicks over the last month, or how many unique visitors uh, visited some site broken down by some user demographic. So in these types of queries, uh, what we're not doing is we're not dumping an entire data set, nor are we really querying for an individual row. What we really care about is a filtered view of some set of data, and we're primarily concerned with performing some sort of aggregation. Um, in order to answer some of these questions, uh, there's different solutions that we actually tried, and I'm sure many of you have tried as well. Uh, we started out with looking at relational databases, and within this class of solutions, you have MySQL, you have Postgres, many others. Um, what we found with trying to use relational databases was the scan speed over your data tended to be quite slow. So we also looked at NoSQL key value stores. Uh, within this class of data stores, you have solutions like HBase, and like Cassandra can kind of be placed here as well. And when you're trying to do like business intelligence style queries with a lot of aggregates with these NoSQL key value stores, uh, what you often end up doing is pre-computing results. So you try and pre-compute out every single, every single query that a user can make. And what we found was the pre-computation time was getting to be really, really expensive. Um, we also actually evaluated a bunch of commercial databases um, for these types of queries. You know, you have your verticas, you have your redshifts, and many, many other solutions. Um, but we tended to prefer open source. Uh, we believe that no solution is going to exactly meet your needs. And the customization and flexibility you get with open source is actually really powerful. So a few years ago, we actually ended up building our own data store, and that data store is called Druid. Uh, Druid was first open sourced in late 2012. Since then, it's seen a growing 
uh, community, and we've seen con contributors from many different organizations. Uh, Druid now runs in production at companies you've probably heard of, such as Yahoo or Netflix, and many other startups that you probably haven't heard of. Um, Druid is primarily designed from the ground up uh, for low latency ingestion and aggregation. So Druid is highly optimized for the types of queries that we were trying to make. And why Druid is particularly good uh, for a certain class of queries is uh, really in its architecture. And I just have some examples here. Uh, imagine we have a raw data set uh, like the one I have showing here. Um, this could be a sample data set from online advertising data. You might have a timestamp dimension. Um, you might have a bunch of attributes. Um, and you might have a couple of metrics in here. And one of the first things that Druid does when it ingests data is it tries to roll the data up. And what we mean by roll up is instead of storing every single raw event, you try and do a group by over the attributes or dimensions of the data set. Uh, you try and aggregate the metrics involved with the raw data, and you truncate the timestamps. So as opposed to storing all the raw data, you store hourly truncated data. Um, what Druid further does is it partitions data by time. Uh, time is a bit of a special dimension in Druid right now. Uh, maybe one day it won't be. Um, but in this example here, how Druid shards data is basically it creates an immutable block of data for a certain range of time. And this block is called a Druid segment. Uh, so here we have two segments for two separate days of data. Most of the data in Druid is immutable, and immutable data confers a lot of advantages. Uh, for one, you can get reconsistency for free uh, when you're dealing with immutable data. And Druid's parallelism model is such that you use one thread to scan one immutable segment. So if you want to do more concurrent reads, uh, you can just add more cores, and you can get more reads that way. Uh, you can also have multiple threads scan the same underlying data. So really, Druid is a system that's really, really optimized for reads. Um, we try and keep our segments such that computation or scans over a given segment usually completes in an order of milliseconds. And what that allows for is pretty efficient resource utilization. Um, you keep your units of computation small, and you frequently yield resources. And that's actually pretty good for, in a multi-tenant environment. And finally, with uh, Druid's concept of immutable segments, uh, it's a pretty simple distribution and replication model. When you want to load, balance, move data around, you just actually move blocks of data around. And you, when you want to replicate data, you just replicate segments. You just create blocks. Um, some more information. Uh, Druid is fundamentally a column store. And the advantages of column stores uh, versus row, row stores for doing aggregation, for doing business intelligence style queries is pretty well documented. Um, you only scan and load whatever it is you need. And with most column stores, there's a lot of different compression algorithms that you can introduce. Um, Druid also borrows a lot of ideas from search infrastructure. So there's unique indexes that it builds, uh, such as inverted indexes, um, if you're not familiar with inverted indexes, you don't have to worry too much. Um, the idea is that Druid builds a lot of unique indexes that make sure that when you issue a query, only exactly the data that's pertaining to that query is ever scanned. So it's pretty uh, efficient about doing reads. In the early days of Druid, um, the architecture was pretty simple. Uh, a few years ago, all you could do with Druid was basically uh, you would have your data, your static set of data, in a distributed file system somewhere. You would run a MapReduce job over that data, uh, create the segment structure that Druid understands, and load it across a set of Druid nodes called historical nodes. And historical nodes are pretty simple. Uh, they know how to load data, drop data, and scan data really quickly. In front of the historical nodes, we have another set of nodes called broker nodes. And broker nodes, encapsulate query scatter gather functionality. So when you send a query to a broker node, 
It knows what pieces of data live where. It forwards the query down. The historical nodes compute their portion of the answer in parallel, return results to the broker node, the broker merges results, and returns to the caller. So uh, we deployed Druid into production a few years ago, and what we gained with using Druid was we felt we had solved our query latency problem. Um, Druid gave us arbitrary data exploration, and it gave us very fast queries. Uh, some benchmarks or some results from our Druid cluster as of a few months ago um, on data sets that are over 100 terabytes in size, uh, the vast majority of our queries return in an order of milliseconds. So we introduced Druid, um, but there were still a bunch of problems that were still remaining. Uh, in the first version of Druid, we had to load data versus uh, in this MapReduce process, and batch loading data was very slow. We still didn't fully have this concept of real time. Um, we could not explore events as they were occurring. And if we were able to do that, there were a lot of features that we could unlock, such as alerts, uh, we could do operational monitoring, and so forth. So to talk a little bit more about how to build a real time data pipeline, I'm actually gonna hand things off to Gian, um, who's gonna go into a little bit more detail. <clears throat> hey, uh, cool. I think the mic works. Um, so, like Feng Jin said, uh, we sort of, um, in the early days, realized that what makes sense is to separate data processing and data storage from data querying. And so the data querying system that we ended up using was Druid. And like Feng Jin said, for data processing in the early days, we used Hadoop uh, MapReduce, um, which worked, but it had some issues. Uh, so, right, so it looks sort of like this. Hadoop for pre-processing and storage and Druid for queries. Um, the way that we did things uh, back in those days, which was maybe two years ago, is our clients uploaded data to S3. Uh, we're all running, our, our service all runs in the Amazon cloud. Um, and we use Hadoop and Pig to clean it up, transform it, and join it. Uh, and by joining it, um, I mean that our data is mostly ad tech data, so we have impressions and clicks, and we want to correlate those to figure out things like click-through rate. Um, so after running those MapReduce jobs, we load the result into Druid, and the typical turnaround time for that whole process is two to eight hours after the event occurs. And from that point, it's available for the sort of arbitrary slice and dice analytics Feng Jin was talking about. Um, what we started doing last year was building a real-time version of this pipeline. Um, so we decided to go, go back to what the bad pipeline actually does and figure out how we can make it real-time. So there's, there's three things that a data pipeline does. You have to acquire raw data somehow. You have to process that data, the, the transforming and cleaning and joining. And you have to load the process data into your query engine, um, which in our case is Druid. Um, so we attack each of these three things independently. Um, the first thing, uh, acquiring raw data, we use Kafka for. For those not familiar with Kafka, it's um, an open source product uh, from LinkedIn. Um, it's, a, it's sort of a big message queue in the sky. Uh, you have messages coming in, messages going out, and it buffers them up for you. It's very high throughput. It's got a straightforward design, which was the, the reason that we chose it over the other things out there. Um, and what we did was we put an HTTP API in front of it so our customers can post this stuff over the web. The architecture of a Kafka system looks something like this. Uh, you have Kafka brokers sitting in the middle. You have producers on the left, which are things that generate events. And you have consumers on the right, which are things that process events. Uh, the nice thing about this is that the producers and consumers don't have to know about each other. The producers put things into Kafka and the consumers take things out. Um, and if one of them is having issues, then as long as the Kafka brokers in the middle are working, which they usually are, everything is fine. Um, the next thing to tackle was processing events, the cleaning up, transforming, and joining. So for that, we use Storm. Um, it's a stream processor. It's uh, also open source. It was originally developed at a little startup called Backtype and then popularized at Twitter. Um, it processes one event at a time. You set up these sort of uh, computation graphs where tuples come in somewhere and then fly around and eventually fly out. Um, and 
Right, so we want these storm topologies, which is what storm jobs are called, to do the same thing that our Hadoop jobs had done. Um, so we look at what the Hadoop jobs do. Uh, they, they're MapReduce jobs, they do three things. Um, they load data from somewhere, in Hadoop it's usually S3 or HDFS. Uh, they map the data, which is sort of taking every event and assigning a key and a value to it. And they reduce the events, um, which is taking uh, every thing, every value with the same key, collating it together, and then doing some sort of reduction on it, which in our case is usually an, a join or an aggregation. Um, load and map operations are pretty streaming friendly. There's not really much to do with them. You can load one event at a time and map one event at a time, um, but it's assigning a key and value to it. The reduce is the tricky part. Um, the semantics of reduce in a batch job are collecting all values with the same key, which presents a challenge in a streaming environment because you don't necessarily know when all things with the same key have come in. I mean, the key might be, a, uh, in our case, a impression ID. And we may have an impression with that ID and a click with that ID. And if no one ever clicks on the ad, then the click will never come in. If someone clicks on it in 20 minutes, then it'll come in after 20 minutes. Um, so what we do, and what's fairly common, is to uh, put a window on these operations. And so that means we first see, the, we first see a key of some sort. Uh, we start a timer and collect things with that same key. And um, eventually that timer runs out and whatever we've got by that point, we do the reduce on. Um, this works, it's not perfect, but um, it works well enough for most applications. Um, the last thing to do is load uh, process data into your query engine. Um, so for us, that was Druid. And like Fangjin said, in the early days, Druid's architecture was um, batch ingestion based. So at some point, we had to make a streaming ingestion system for Druid. Um, and what we did was we looked at what we had. Uh, Druid has a indexing system which can take data and create data segments. Um, it has a serving system, the historical nodes, which can take data segments and answer queries on them. And so we just sort of uh, slammed them together and we have these things called real-time indexers that uh, can build indexes and then as they're building them, allow queries to occur on them. Um, the architecture looks something like this when you put it together. The Kafka producers aren't pictured, but they're, they're there on the left um, off screen. Data ends up in Kafka brokers. Um, storm workers pick it up, do the joining, cleaning, transforming. Uh, they push things to, they push events to Druid real-time workers which are building data segments and also allowing queries on them. And then the Druid real-time workers periodically uh, finalize their segments, which is converting them from a write-optimized form to a read-optimized form and hand them off to historical nodes. That's really important because, like Feng Jin said, um, the data segment format is optimized really heavily for reads, uh, but the real-time workers cannot directly create that format. They have to create, they have to use a write-optimized format and then convert it to read-optimized later. Um, so while that's occurring, uh, the Druid query broker is able to merge results from both the historical cluster and the real-time workers. So a typical Druid cluster will have the past uh, one to two hours of data in the real-time nodes and all other data going back potentially months or years in the historical cluster. Um, and so if you make a query for the past 24 hours, then one or two hours of data will come from real-time and the other uh, 22 will come from the historical nodes. Um, so we end up adding this third row, which is uh, the real-time system that we developed. Um, data comes into Kafka, then gets processed by Storm, and then we use Druid for querying. And Hadoop at this point is not really in the picture anymore. So this is what we gained. Um, we got some cool stuff. We got the ability for Druid queries to reflect new events within seconds. Uh, we don't have this two date hour delay anymore. Um, the systems are fully decoupled, which is good. This means that if for some reason there's issues in Storm, then we can still accept data in Kafka, so our customers are still able to post data to us over the web. And Druid queries still work. The data becomes a little more stale, but we can still query whatever was ingested up to that point. Um, there are brief processing delays during maintenance because we need to restart Storm topologies, but during that time, again, query performance and availability are not affected. But unfortunately, um, stream processing is not perfect. Uh, the two biggest issues that we've faced um, are that it's difficult to handle corrections of existing data, 
And what I mean by that is if you have some server that had some issue and posted data very late, um, it may be difficult to reintegrate that into the cluster. Um, or if you have some data that is bad in some way and needs to be fixed, it can be difficult to unload the old data and load in new data. Um, the other issue is that the windows for the reduces um, may be too small for fully accurate operations. One thing that we see pretty commonly in our data pipelines is that if we have a window of maybe 10 or 15 minutes, um, we can get over 95% of the data joined up properly, but that remaining 5% um, gets lost because it may take someone an hour to click on an ad. Um, and uh, that last little bit is, it would be nice to have it. Um, so Hadoop is actually good at these things. Uh, Hadoop can do very big windows. All you need to do is load all the data into a big MapReduce job and let it go. Um, and Hadoop can handle corrections with existing data. All you have to do is rerun the same Hadoop job on the older data set. Um, so what we can do is we can bring back Hadoop and actually use both a batch pipeline and a real-time pipeline. Um, this has been described by others uh, and uh, there's has been called a Lambda architecture. Um, so this is our open source implementation of uh, Lambda architecture. Um, and the way it works, at least in our case, is that we uh, automatically do batch reprocessing for any data older than a few hours. Um, and that's mostly, the main reason that it's automatic as opposed to um, on demand is just because we always want to redo things with larger join windows. Um, so when the batch job runs, those segments replace real-time segments in Druid. That's a, a sort of a built-in Druid feature that, that makes it easier to run this sort of system. Um, and the Druid query broker continues to mer merge results from both systems. Um, it can take segments from the real-time nodes, um, also segments handed off from real-time to historical, and also segments created by uh, the batch indexer and push historical nodes and um, integrate results from all three of those uh, in one unified query system. Um, the architecture looks something like this when you put it together. So you still have Kafka, Storm, and Druid on the, the top path, um, the real-time path, and that's operating in real-time over on-time data. Uh, and then the bottom path, the batch path, uh, operates, in our case, some hours later over all your data, not just data that's on-time. Um, and that may, uh, the data that gets processed by that path replaces data from the top path. Um, so, uh, as promised, this stuff is all open source. Uh, the, the cornerstones of the stack, the, f the four big pieces, are Druid, Storm, Hadoop, and Kafka, and they all have websites, and some of them have Twitters. Um, there's also glue between them, which uh, if you've had to integrate open source software before, you know that sometimes those little red arrows are kind of a pain to develop. Um, so luckily, that's, those are also open source. Um, the Kafka to Storm link, Storm Kafka, was a community contributed module that recently became part of the main Storm distribution. Um, the Storm the Druid thing, Tranquility, is something that we open sourced a few months ago. Um, the Kafka to Hadoop link, Kamu, is something that was open sourced uh, at LinkedIn, the same place Kafka came from. Um, if you're using S3 instead of HDFS, there's something from Pinterest that's similar. Um, and the Hadoop to Druid link is the Hadoop Druid indexer, which is just part of Druid. Um, right, so uh, you put all this together, what you get is queries answered quickly on fresh data. Kafka is providing fast and reliable event transport. Uh, Storm and Hadoop are cleaning and preparing data for Druid. Druid is handling queries and managing merging and complexity in the serving layer. Um, and we call this the real-time analytics data stack, mostly because we like the acronym. Um, we uh, wrote a blog post about it recently as well, which goes into a little bit more detail. Um, thanks, guys. Yes? Uh, what do you use as the backing storage mechanism for Druid? Is it HDFS or something else? So the question is, what's the backing storage mechanism for Druid? Um, it's pluggable. Uh, the two most common are S3 and HDFS, and we use S3. Uh, 
Um, <clears throat> so the question is streaming in old data as opposed to doing uh, batch ingestion of old data. Um, currently, that's not possible. The, the, the way that Druid currently supports um, ingesting of old data is uh, wholesale replaces of intervals. And so you say, you know, this hour, um, get rid of the data from this hour and put this new data in for the hour. And it's an atomic uh, operation. Um, yeah, so what we, we actually have a couple of pipelines, so, so the thing was continuous sporadic updates of old data. Um, we have a couple of pipelines that do have that feature and usually what we do is we do the first cut in real time um, and Druid has a uh, parameter that says how late it will accept data. Um, so we set that to something reasonable, um, usually on the order of 10, 15 minutes. We do the first cut in real time and then um, we run a series of batch jobs nightly. And so the, the initial cut comes in in real time, and then after that, there's maybe like a few hour delay for things to get updated. Um, so, uh, do you have any, or do you know the kind of times queries are going to be run before time? Like, are you doing some sort of query analysis to know what indexes have built and why? Uh, in order to get high performance queries? Uh, the question is, um, do we need to know what kinds of queries you're doing before time to get efficient queries? Uh, no. So um, Druid doesn't do any pre-computation and doesn't do any, the indexes are not customizable or really smart in any way. You get the same indexes on all columns, no matter what. Um, it's, it gets its speed not from being really smart about how it indexes things, but it gets its speed from just being really, really good at scanning stuff. Um, and also really good at filtering. Um, so, uh, yeah, does that answer your question? Cool. Um, okay, cool, thanks.